it is time to start the crisis jam. So welcome everyone. I am Vic Armstrong and I'll be your host for this week. It is my pleasure to be here with you back on the, on the uh, hippest trip in America. Um, so let us get started. Um, Karen, if we could have our first slide. Is my screen not showing? Uh, maybe it's just on my computer. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I just want to remind, remind everyone about um, our 988 Crisis Jam site where you can find all of the resources and all of the latest updates. Um, also want to, um, I just want to let you know we're going to, we are going to, uh, oh, there you are, there we are, 98 Crisis Jam Learning Community. Um, I also want to let folks know that we're going to, we're going to change our schedule just a little bit because I understand that um, uh, we're going to have, uh, only have Richard, we're here with us for just a, a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and move into our SAMHSA update with Richard McKeon. Thank you so much, Vic, really appreciate it. And I'll only be able to be part of uh, this until 12 to 12.30 uh, because of some other uh, uh, meetings that uh, we, need to, we need to be able to get to. Uh, so I'll mention a couple of things um, that I think it's important for this group in particular to know. Uh, you know so one is that uh, the Center for Mental Health Services at SAMHSA um, convened a starting uh, uh, last week and will be uh, continuing um, a subject matter expert um, uh, panel on uh, uh, children's uh, crisis services. Um, you know, and uh, that has um, the first half of that has taken place, thought it went very well, got great input and we're grateful for Dr. Everett as well as for um, Melinda Baldwin for their leadership. Um, on, you know, on this. And as we move forward with 988 and with uh, working to transform uh, uh, behavioral crisis services in the United States, we obviously need to be continually mindful of the importance of um, making sure that the system is uh, accounting for the unique needs of, uh, of, of children and adolescents. The service systems are oftentimes different uh, you know, uh, for both. Um, so we are really looking to make sure that children, young youth, young adults and adults all get the same high level of care. Um, in, in other news, I think I mentioned on this call last week that we had convened uh, the first meeting of the um, 988 working group which is part of the uh, Suicide Prevention and Crisis Care Subcommittee of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Behavioral Health Coordinating Committee. I know that that is a mouthful in terms of bureaucratic structures and so forth, uh, but, it is, but it is quite important. And um, this effort um, is co-chaired uh, by myself and um, Ellen Blackwell from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So we're particularly grateful to have uh, CMS engaged in this effort um, with us. And we have, uh, we have begun to establish uh, uh, separate lines of effort uh, for that, one on data and evaluation, one on workforce, one on um, uh, communications and public awareness for 988. And then we're also looking at establishing one specifically um, on, uh, on, on financing. Uh, you know, so uh, as I said, to me, this is the most coordinated high level effort I've ever seen within the US Department of Health and Human Services. So I'm really excited about it. I think there are a lot of great opportunities that will be able to um, uh, come out of this. Um, you know, and then there are, the, there are other pieces to the suicide prevention and crisis care subcommittee that are being worked on. One is on an HHS strategic plan for suicide prevention. Um, and that is being uh, co-chaired by uh, CDC and ASPE, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Performance and uh, Evaluation. And then one on comprehensive community-based uh, suicide prevention 
uh, services. And that is being co-chaired by the Administration on Children and Families and by HRSA. So I said there are a lot of important work going on and obviously SAMHSA is continually engaged around issues related to uh, 2988 um, as we you know, have just started the federal fiscal year. Um, as most of you probably are aware, I should mention, we, have a, you know, we are now functioning under a continuing resolution uh, that, but however, the administration has uh, uh, provided a request to Congress, what's called an anomaly, because usually under the continuing resolution, it would mean you're, you are at the prior year's funding. So there's a specific request to make an exception for that uh, for the 102 million that was requested in the president's budget uh, for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Given the time sensitivities around 988, um, you know, that, that exists and the fact that that was a quadrupling of the previous appropriation. So I will stop there. Thanks for the opportunity, Vic. You're on mute, Vic. Yeah, it wouldn't be me if I didn't have at least one time during the day when I when someone has to tell me I'm on mute. Uh, but thank you so much, Richard, for sharing. And I, I just want to say thank you to Samson for all the great work that you all do. And a couple of things that you say really, really, it's also important, but a couple of things just really resonate with me. And one is uh, really the need for crisis services that do speak specifically to the needs of, of children. Um, because it is different. It's different, not just in service array, but I think it's also different, different in the way that we need to respond um, when you have children that have mental health emergencies, because oftentimes you are uh, dealing with parents who um, they're not interested in what the clinical diagnosis is or, or the, the medical speak. They know that their child is having um, issues and they want someone to respond. And so, um, so I think that's extremely important. I'm also... Um, extremely glad to hear about the emphasis on data. I think that we we, we at Behavioral Health have always kind of lagged behind in, um, in, in data and tracking. And so I'm, I'm extremely pleased to hear about the, um, the, the use of data to inform the work that we're doing. And then also when you talked about um, a strategic plan for, um, for suicide prevention, um, I think that also is so important because, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that we need to better understand the science behind suicide. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to prevent suicide before um, someone and intervene before someone reaches that point of suicidality. So thank you so much for sharing those things and just so, so very, very important. All right. So we are now going to move into our featured presentation. Um, by Dr. Uh, Pierre Luigi Mancini. Do we have a, oh, I'm sorry, before we get there, we have our quote of the week. Our quote of the week um, is by Dr. Miriam E. Delphin Rittman, game changer in how we think about crisis response. 988 is a once in a lifetime opportunity to strengthen crisis responsiveness. I could not agree more. And I think we talked so much on this call about how this is an opportunity. Uh, and, and it is uh, an opportunity that we may have one shot at to get this to get this right. And it's so important that we lay the right foundation for this. So um, fabulous quote. All right. Now we are ready for our uh, featured presentation. Do we I know Stephanie is not with us. Do we have an introduction for Dr. Mancini? Or are we just going to launch right into his presentation? It would be I'm great. willing to say. Oh, go ahead, Carrie. No, go right ahead, Paul. I think Pierre Luigi is amazing, is the truth. And look, what he's done for communities around the world, not just in the United States, and particularly Hispanic, Latino, Latinx communities, is, is amazing. And uh, uh, Dr. Mancini has committed to making changes, getting access to care, and uh, to be honest, uh, has driven our organization to do better, to find ways to look at data on how underserved communities are better engaged, how we do that work, and uh, very grateful for all of it. And I uh, also, uh, I don't know that I can make a pitch for his book other than he has one and you should look at it, and I happen to love it. Uh, so with that, I can hand it off to uh, Dr. Mancini. Great to see you, Pierre Luigi. Thank you, Paul. 
Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. My name is Pierluigi Mancini, and I've been working towards health equity and eliminating health disparities in the United States for over 30 years. But the last 20 years, I have particularly worked with ethnic minorities and immigrants, a big part of that with Latino communities uh, in the United States, and also working on um, eliminating health disparities and focusing on racial and social justice. Um, I also have a quote that I like to start many of my presentations with, and this is attributed to Nelson Mandela. If you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. And I believe this is such a simple way to explain what it is that we need to do in order to help individuals. Next slide, please. Just a, a brief definition as to why this is so important. Um, as of last year, we, we have over uh, almost 45 million foreign born individuals in the United States. And what, next slide, please. The majority of them are arriving from Latin America and there is an uptick from Asia. Now, this administration, we're seeing a larger number of refugees. You, you've read all the stories about people coming out of Afghanistan that, that helped the United States, but there are refugees that have been waiting all over the world uh, for several years because the process is lengthy to come here. So now the number is gonna be uh, uh, supposed to be 125,000 this year. Um, the last year of the last administration, the number had dwindled down to 12,000. So we are expecting more and many of them coming from the Middle East and um, places in the world that were really not equipped to, to serve linguistically. Next slide, please. A point of personal clarification because I have focused on the Latinx community for all these years. And I just wanna let you know the majority, uh, over 60% of Latinos in the United States were born here. So the growth of Latinx communities is not because of immigration. It is um, birth rates that are driving that growth. But we still have 40% who are foreign born. And that's where a lot of the linguistic access happens for Hispanic Latino communities. Next slide, please. And then the, the biggest clarification is what is limited English? So we have about 45% of, of this 45 million uh, who claim or report that they speak English less than very well. That's about 23 million people in this country. To put this part into perspective, English proficiency has a range. You know, most people feel that if I can answer, how are you in English, that I must speak well enough to access any behavioral health services. Well, that's not the case. Some people may just know enough to be cordial. Some people may know enough to know about their job. For example, if, if your mechanic is a foreign born individual, he or she may be able to tell you exactly what's wrong with your car and that's gonna cost you $750 because no matter what it is, it always seems to cost $750. So, but if you ask that person to talk to you about their suicidal ideation, they will not be able to do that in English because of the limitations that they have with language. And that part is missed in many people's attempts to uh, serve communities that have limited English proficiency. Next slide, please. So, you know, this terminology that you see, um, health equity, disparities and literacy, as it applies to language, um, you know, it basically means that the culturally competent behavioral health systems, those that, that are really providing culturally and linguistically appropriate services, like you know, the 988 line. I love the fact that it has a, a go-to for Spanish, uh, or even mobile crisis services. And there are many of you in, 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 in attendance today that are working really hard to make this happen. And the result, the benefit, the reward of that is gonna be the potential to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities when it comes to behavioral health services. The, um, you know, when individuals do not understand what the providers are telling them or have the linguistic ability to access those services, then they're not able to follow the guidance for them to be able to get better. Next slide, please. 
A couple of just brief, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, equity and equality. So equality is sameness, but sameness only works if everyone starts at the same place. So you see on the left, everybody gets one box, that's equality, but if everyone was the same height, they would all reach the apple. Now inequity is fairness. So inequity is more about making sure people get access to those opportunities. So you redistribute those resources. And when it comes to culture and language, again, many well-meaning people want to do this and they just don't know how to get started or they don't know how to build it. Um, but there is opportunities for us to learn how to do that together because some places are successfully being able to meet the needs of those individuals. Uh, next slide, please. And then health equity, everyone deserves that fair chance. You know, people, uh, this foreign born population that I've, I've focused on for so many years, they came here to grow. They benefit the United States. They, they build businesses. The level of entrepreneurship in this community is huge. But when they end up with a behavioral health issue, they cannot access our infrastructure. And that's a barrier. They don't have that fair chance to lead a healthy life if they encounter a behavioral health problem while they're here. Next slide, please. But what I wanted to focus on is the inequalities, the inequities. This, these are the ones especially that can be avoidable or, or that are unfair or unjust. And you know the, the social ones, for example, when an organization ends up creating barriers because of race, gender, class, um, sexual orientation, or immigration status. You know, that's an inequity that we can work on. Once we recognize the problem, we're able to, um, to deliver solutions. And the economic inequities, you know, we're asking people who may not have $100 to show up for the initial evaluation or if they're uninsured, even worse, or if they have a large family they're taking care of. And then the environmental um, inequities, which is where I see a lot of the biggest barriers, is places where individuals have to live because of whatever economic level they're in, don't have the services that they need. And that's not only in rural areas, but also in urban areas and the individuals just don't have the access for it. And that's where a lot of the social determinants of health come into play. Next slide, please. And then, you know, the disparities of these differences in, in health outcomes um, are affected when it comes to um, behavioral health behaviors. You know, there's the physical ones like smoking, poor nutrition, lack of exercise, but we also have um, individuals that we're realizing today that, that do not get a certain service because the medical provider felt, oh, they're strong enough, they don't need this kind of medication or they don't need this kind of treatment. And that concept of equity and, and disparity are, are inseparable in the practical implementation. So here's where policies and pra practices aimed at promoting the goal of health equity will not immediately eliminate the health disparities, but they'll provide a foundation for moving closer to that goal. And when it comes to the causes of, of these disparities, and we have you know, several areas where um, we can see these disparities in mental health, the biggest one that I continue to encounter is language. Many people say, well, we'll just use an interpreter or we use the language line. Well, those can be helpful, but what I'm finding more and more is that a lot of the time they're being hurtful. And we need to be able to have a, a fair playing field for individuals to get the information the clinician wants to tell them and for the clinician to truly understand what the individual is trying to tell them. Next slide, please. So some things you may not um, truly recognizes this concept of health literacy, but you know, the three key words of health literacy is obtain, process, and understand. You know, and how many of us, even, even people on the screen, respected professionals, how many of us have been in our doctor's office and the doctor tells us something we don't understand and we're embarrassed? We may not want to ask that question because you know the assumption is, hey, I'm a smart guy. I should know this, right? I'll Google it after. 
Um, so if we are having that and we understand the physician clearly and they understand us clearly, imagine what someone that struggles with, with the language, what they're going through. You know, first of all, that physician, if they're using an interpreter, is getting whatever that interpreter is telling them. And if the interpreter is not trained, then we don't know what the interpreter is telling the physician in order for that or clinician to make that determination. So that individual is not gonna be able to obtain process and understand. So we will not have health literacy. If, if we wanna make sure that, that those individuals can obtain process and understand the information, uh, we have to make sure that, that we address the issues of health literacy in our communities and in our organizations. Next slide, please. And then there is cultural literacy, you know, the ability to, to converse fluently in this idiom, solutions and informal content, which creates and constitutes uh, a dominant culture. So being familiar with street sign and knowing- The only thing- Can we mute please? Um, thank you. Um, being able to understand you know, where that individual comes from. So, you know, for 18 years, I ran the only multilingual organization here in Georgia that I founded. And we had to do our homework. We had people from 17 different countries. And one of the things that we realized from the beginning is if I did a little homework beforehand, if I knew this individual was from Guatemala or from Cuba, um, and, I, and I knew a little bit of it, that broke the ice, that gave a sense of trust that usually we don't get, or we can even make worse if we don't know enough about the, the, the country or the origin of the individual, and we end up saying something that insults them. So cultural literacy is, and it can be dangerous. You know, I often use the example of, of a physician that walks into a room and, and congratulates the young unmarried Ethiopian women on her pregnancy. But he doesn't realize he's putting her in danger because in Ethiopian culture to be pregnant while not married, many of the women resource to suicide or suicide attempts because of the shame that they feel they're bringing. So this physician was thinking, I'm giving her great news, but in fact, what he was doing was putting her in danger without even knowing. Next slide, please. And you know, here's a clear example. Um, Next slide. Oh, we lost the slides. Well, so the next slide is, is, you know, for those of you who are sports fans like me, it has a soccer ball, it's got an Australian football, and it's got an American football football. So all three sports are called football. But if I show up to an Atlanta Falcons game in my Juventus, uh, which is my favorite Italian, you know, football team in, in Italy. If I show up in my Juventus gear at an Atlanta Falcons game, there is a disconnect. You know, they invited me to a football game, right? But my understanding was it's what is traditionally called soccer here. So there's these differences on um, knowing enough about the culture. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to get the slides back. So I'll just finish up with... You know, if we don't um, work on, thank you, if, if without health and cultural literacy, we're not gonna be able to serve those that are most in need. Next slide, please. And then a couple of slides on language. So systems, systems and providers don't set out to make it difficult for minorities and immigrants to access behavioral health services. I truly believe that. I think people have great intentions, but sometimes those great intentions, if they're not fully educated, can create disasters. They definitely don't yield the best results. So, you know, and then there's also clarification that uh, what it is that we need. Um, so let me start with two words, interpreter and translator. Next slide, please. So many people mix these words. Well, Translation is the conversion of written text from one language to another. So you translate a brochure, right? 
but an interpreter is the re-expression of spoken messages in a spoken form in a second language. So if you are speaking with someone face-to-face -face or virtually, and there is oral communication, you want to call an interpreter to help you with that, not a translator, right? So something as simple as this can create so much confusion because if we don't know who the players are, if we don't know what the needs are, then we're not gonna be able to be successful. Next slide, please. And then language competency. And competency really means um, three things. You know, you have to be able to be fluent. And fluency is be able to speak, read, write, and comprehend. You need all four, speak, read, write, and comprehend. So some people feel if they hire someone who speaks another language, then I'm, I'm covered. Well, no, you need to do a language test. You need to make sure that that person reads, writes, speaks, and comprehends. Because the individual that comes to you for help may not be able to read or may not be able to speak, or they may be able to write uh, something. But if your clinician or your staff member can't read it, then you don't have someone that can help you. And we also have to look at attitudes, personal attitudes, organizational attitudes. There are many people that, for whatever reason, do not like people that speak with an accent. Many people do not like to serve individuals that come from other countries. And if you had that at your front desk, if you had that as the first line of contact that the individual needed help comes with, then you're not able to help that person. You're putting someone back out in, in whatever level of crisis that they have. Next slide, please. And then, you know, the personal language, the personal responsibilities, do you know what your language needs are in your community? You know, have you ever looked at your service area? If you have a five, 10, 15 mile, whatever it is, do you know what those language needs are? Many of us haven't done it because we say, well, nobody comes here that speaks that language. Well, they don't come there because they don't know that you may be able to help us. Uh, so we need to be able to do our homework. Next slide, please. So, you know, briefly, and if we had more time, I usually put this in a poll, but you may be surprised. What are the top 10 foreign languages spoken in, in US households today? You know, after Spanish is Chinese, but after Chinese, is Tagalog. How many of you have heard of that? It's a Philippine language, but that's the third one in the United States, right? And then Vietnamese, Arabic, French, Korean, Russian, etc. You know, and these can change depending on your zip code. Um, but if we don't learn what the needs are, then we're not able to prepare ourselves for it. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, yeah, there are the languages. So you have um, Spanish, uh, Chinese, Tagalog, uh, Vietnamese. Next slide, please. And this is relevant because remember, 45% of uh, foreign born individuals that are living in the United States, about 23 million people speak English less than very well. That means they cannot easily access uh, where we are. Next slide, please. And I don't know if they're making these slides um, available to you. I hope they are. And you have my contact information. So if there's any questions, um, and I believe there may be some time now for us to talk about this. Thank you all very much. I think my 15 minutes are up, barely. Um, so I turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mansu. That was fabulous. Uh, we do have a couple of people uh, uh, slated for our round table who will discuss. I do want to say before we uh, turn it over to Stephen Shelby. Um, you know, the, the thing that I love about your presentation is, um, is that it all comes down to intersectionality. And um, I saw a lot of, um, a lot in the chat where people were, were um, talking about how you could apply these same things to the deaf population. And I think you, you could just about plug any historically marginalized group um, in and while some of the, the details would, would shift, the premise is the same that, um, that it's that intersectionality that we don't often think about. So thank you so much for sharing that. You know, um, if, you, if you allow me one more minute, because you know the deaf and hard of hearing community 
it's also a great need. Now they have an advantage that in some states they've successfully sued those states in order for those needs to be met. Whereas language is not a disability. So we were not able to use that resource, but uh, there is still a great need for clinicians who speak American Sign Language. There are many people who are not able to access behavioral health services because of that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. thank you. All right, so we do have um, for our roundtable reactions, uh, we have uh, Steve Hammerdinger and we have Shelby Rowe. Um, so I don't know who wants to go first, but um, let's start with uh, Steve. Is Steve on? I, I don't see Steve so far. So if we could just hold on one second and if we could highlight him so I could see him, I don't see him right now. Okay. He is in the chat, so I know he's nearby. Yep. Yep, he is I on. See, yep, I see him. He's, I can't make him bigger and I would prefer that so I can see him better. He's in a little bitty box. I usually can pin him, but I can't. You have a spotlight on him. That's his, I'm sorry, I can't make it larger than that. Hold on one second. Steve Let me... says, I don't look any better any larger. <laughs> okay. I'll, I can see him for like this big, but. <laughs> yeah, so he's just reiterating. I don't look any better if I'm bigger. So <laughs> smaller is probably preferred. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing him, Sandra. The point that Dr. Mancini made, we're similar to the deaf community. And I've had a wonderful opportunity to meet him a few years ago, I believe, when I came to do a presentation with our Department of Health here. And I was very impressed because we seem to be on the same page on many issues. As he said, ASL is probably the first, fourth most common used language in the United States. We typically view deaf people as disabled, so no one seems to worry about that or plan for language access. So the point I'm trying to make is that a few weeks ago, when we were allowed to speak at a group, I read many states' plans and I did not see clearly any description within those plans on how they would provide language access. And one question did come up that was very interesting, that they should develop resources in various states to meet the needs of signing deaf people. <laughs> and there was a statewide focus on that. We published a book with, I missed it, Jody. Neighborhood Law. I do need to give it to you for a moment. Um, Association State um, for the Health Program. And that book really described how um, you know how to make um, it things available to the to, to the deaf. And um, And we can um, upload that later if we need to.
I know that Shelby is also in, in the round table here and I don't wanna take up all of the time so we can have her talk about some things as well. Hi everyone, um, it's good to be here. I think that our, you know, listening to um, the um, wonderful things that Steve was sharing with us was a perfect example of why it is so important when we're looking at crisis care that we provide translators, um, that we have that ability to offer help. You know, where I live in Oklahoma City, um, a few years ago, we had um, a deaf homeless man that was actually killed by police because he was not responding <laughs> to what he was being told because he couldn't hear. And so he didn't respond, he didn't stop. Um, and so when we're looking at crisis care, I think for our state infrastructure, um, one, it is the right thing to do because we have to provide that care to everyone, but also you know, thinking of making sure that when we provide that care, that we're doing it in a way, you know, anytime that someone allows us to intervene in their crisis and ask for help, that is a privilege. They are reaching out and asking for our help. And we know from other things like Dr. Thomas Joyner's interpersonal theory, you know, and I know myself from being a suicide attempt survivor, that when someone is in a crisis, we're feeling disconnected. We're feeling like we don't belong. And we feel like we're a burden on others. And the tendency to be self-dismissive is there for all of us to think, I am not worth the trouble to save. And when we add language barriers on top of already feeling like a burden, or we approach a system, or we approach a receptionist that says, oh, I have to go find someone else to help you, um, that attitude is so important. And I love that Pierre Luigi said that it's not just enough to have someone who speaks that language, but is completely fluent, that they are thinking in that other language so that that help can be seamless and respectful. Um, different organizations, and it's hard to do. Um, at past groups I was with, we thought we had done really well by hiring a translator to translate some of our brochures and our PowerPoints. And then someone who spoke Spanish as their first language looked at our brochures and PowerPoint and laughed at us and was like, oh, bless your heart, you really tried, but this makes no sense um, in our language. You translated it word for word, which doesn't make any sense. Um, so make sure when we're translating that to take the time, take the effort of either through our staffs or through working with um, interpreters and translators that we make our mental health services um, fluent for everyone in crisis. Um, those are kind of my reflecting thoughts and I'm happy Vic if I have a few questions, but I just think this is so timely. Um, and Pierre Luigi, thank you so much for sharing this information because as we build out a system that needs to be equitable for all, um, it needs to be equitable for all. Absolutely. Shelby, thank you so much, Shelby and, and Steve and Dr. Mancini. Thank you so much for your fabulous presentation. Um, this, this discussion is a discussion that we could we could just go on and on and on about because there's, there's so much to talk about in here, but in the interest of time, we will, we will move on. Um, and so next we will move to our crisis talk. Do we have... Uh, El Nathan. Yeah, so El Nathan is on the line. Talk a little bit about the crisis talk for the week. Yes, hi. Okay. Can so you just start talking or? Yes. 
you can just tell us a little bit about your um, services, that would be great. And the um, for this week's crisis talk. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Hello. I'm uh, Elmer van Prince. I'm a psychiatrist in the Netherlands. So uh, when we are talking about uh, struggling with language, uh, you will hear me struggle. But uh, <laughs> well, I did understand that there has been a publication about uh, our uh, crisis model in the Netherlands um, and uh, that I had a short time to uh, talk about it. So um, and I don't know, or there, or everyone has read it and or, or there are any questions or did I just uh, uh, talk a little about it? So I will just start. Uh, but what we uh, have, uh, what we call is uh, intensive home treatment teams, and that's an, an that are uh, um, multidisciplinary outreaching teams that can deliver the full range of acute psychiatric intervention in the community. And one of the goals is to avoid uh, hospital admissions. Um, and uh, we have started in some regions in the Netherlands. And uh, with this multidisciplinary team, we do, uh, for example, home visits for three times a day um, uh, um, uh, by patients with acute uh, uh, severe psychiatric disorders that would be otherwise be uh, admitted at an acute ward. Um, and um, uh, those teams have an availability of, of course, of 24 um, hours a day and uh, at all time they uh, do um, um, crisis assessments and uh, acute intensive home treatment so when we for example see someone in the middle of the night for an uh, acute crisis assessment and he's referred to us by the police or uh, um, um, then we can uh, directly upscale um, uh, in intensive home treatment um, and visit someone for an about three times a day to really avoid uh, hospital admissions. Um, and um, um, uh, a very important part to let this work is also that um, um, those teams have a, a gatekeeping role. So the team controls actually the access to all local acute inpatient beds so that um, uh, all patients that, that that are um, uh, uh, someone thinks that he should be admitted. First, this intensive home treatment teams uh, uh, do an assessment to, to see or they can upscale the, the ambulatory care with intensive home treatment to uh, avoid uh, uh, this admission. And what we see um, with this is that also the um, uh, of course, that, that the total uh, uh, admissions um, went down, but even the forced admissions uh, went down because we, we, in an, in we can really um, uh, uh, put more effort in, in coming in contact with the patient. So the patient doesn't have to come to us, but we come to them. So when we are talking in the other um, uh, talks about also uh, cultural differences and language differences. It it really um, um, is another thing when when you visit the patients at home and you have to um, you you are as a doctor a guest in the patient's home and in the in the culture of of those patients and when everyone is talking another language for example uh, you really have to adapt and and when I, I, I hear the other talks, I, I realize how privileged we are in the Netherlands that we have very good working um, interpreter services also in acute phase by telephone and it's always accessible in all kinds of languages. But um, um, and I won't talk about that for, uh, uh, anymore, but uh, what we see is that it really works, that people also recover um, um, uh, quicker uh, because uh, when you treat them uh, at their um, uh, homes and with the social network uh, really involved in 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 um, in the treatment of the patient and and also the patients can um, um, maybe have lots of symptoms but he can do some 
uh, useful things because he is at home and he is not put out of his own um, uh, total system and everything he trusts in a hospital where he knows no one. Um, you you see that the recovery goes really quicker and patients are are um, 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 think this care is is much better than uh, hospital care. Also, patients with a lot of experience in the past with with uh, acute admissions, and uh, also the professionals um, like it very much because with those multi with this multidisciplinary team. You really can do everything um, uh, what is needed to resolve those crises and also really involve uh, the broader social network. And we know that this social network very often plays a very important role in the crisis. And it's really not the only the psychiatric symptoms, but but um, uh, also the difficulties in in the broader social network that uh, that influence the crisis and, um, and because of managing those crises in the community um, and you can really address all those problems so um, that's in a short summary of what we do thank you so much for that it, it, it's and, and i do want to let folks know you can read the um the entire article um at the um, crisis talk that uh, crisis now um, there was one quick question and, uh, at, at talk.crisisnow.com. You can read the entire article. Uh, there was one quick question, though, Dr. Princeton, on how does uh, intensive home treatment compare with other multi multidisciplinary and team programs uh, like PACT or coordinated specialty care? Yeah, what, um, uh, what we see is that um, uh, lots of these teams have... Um, 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 to, to get into the, that care has uh, uh, a long way to start those care. So what, what we do is that all kinds of new referrals by, uh, by uh, police or, or um, other uh, health services for acute care that you can really acutely start with those intensive uh, treatments. So, um, of course, uh, there are a lot of, um, um, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, co uh, you can really compare it with other uh, multidisciplinary teams, mm -hmm. but what is special about it is, is that it is acutely uh, deliverable in the crisis. So, thank you so much. Um, thank you for sharing that. And I do encourage everyone to go and read the article in its entirety. So at this point, we will move on to our NASPIT updates uh, with Brian Hepburn. Yeah, thank you, Vic. And uh, I'll go really quickly. Uh, just wanted to say that our states uh, continue to be focused on 988 and crisis services. This morning, we had uh, a good call with the commissioner from Louisiana, uh, Karen Stubbs. And uh, I wanted to share a couple of things that she brought up. One uh, is, of course, uh, COVID is still in, in play uh, all across the country. But in Louisiana, they were also hit by Hurricane Ida, which uh, has had a devastating impact on uh, certain parts of Louisiana. So we were asking, her, how are you dealing with your staffing issues? Uh, because we know that uh, workforce is a, a significant issue across the country. And she said that uh, they've been fortunate. They've actually been able to add staff, uh, not lose staff. And she had uh, a couple of suggestions. And one of the suggestions that I want to share is the fact that I said, well, is it money? If we give people more money, will that be helpful? Uh, and she answered, of course, more money is a good thing. But what people are saying is they need a rest. They are burned out. They are exhausted. They need time to catch up, uh, to be able to spend time with their families, just to breathe again. So I, I wanted to bring that up because I think that that's something that often in the United States, we don't give enough credit to, and that is giving people time to rest and relax. And that might be a, a good thing to do for burnout uh, or to offset the risk of burnout. So with that, let me bring in uh, Megan. Megan uh, has a couple of comments. Megan, go ahead. Great. I just wanted to highlight the National Annual 2021 meeting. And um, our annual 2021 meeting highlighted the set of uh, Beyond Bed papers that we do each year. 
And these papers really focused on the different aspects of crisis services. Um, we now have our uh, meeting link up on our website, which includes recordings of each session. Uh, and each of those sessions correlated with one of the papers. So we hope that you'll take a look at them. I, I, they were excellent presentations. There was great state voice and good dialogue. So, uh, and there's the link there for the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, Brian. All right, it is now time for our hot seat with the state leader. And I believe we have Dale Adair, who's gonna play with us today from direct from uh, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> we have Dale up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, for playing with us this afternoon. Or I guess it's, it's afternoon here. It's not afternoon where everyone is, I guess. But here is our question. FCC Commissioner Ajit Pai frequently referenced a spike in lifeline calls in 2017 as part of his explanation for the need for the 988 mental health and suicide prevention crisis hotline. Who or what was the cause of the 2017 spike? You can either answer the question yourself or you can, uh, you can phone a friend or you can ask the audience. Well, it's actually interesting that you, the, the way it's phrased, who or what. Um, but uh, I will actually, if, um, if Jack Roselle is on, I will uh, do a lifeline to Jack. Jack Roselle. <laughs> Hey, how are you, my friends? Um, gosh, I um, I feel like was it that singer who had this song that was uh, Logic that he did uh, at, at one of the award shows? Maybe I, I wanted to be like something positive rather than some god awful tragedy that that drove volume, but I'm not sure. So th there are a number of things I if. In remembering years is, is a challenge for me, um, but um, uh, there were a number of things that happened. I think in 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 2017, um, uh, um, there were a number of uh, uh, no, unfortunately we had we've had these years full of um, mass shootings. Um, I think that's when the Vegas event occurred. Um, uh, we also had a lot of the, uh, um, you know, social unrest. Um, I'm not sure which or if any of those uh, pertain. I also think, I hate to always, I hate to bring uh, politics into it as well, but I think that wasn't that the year that um, the last president uh, was um, inaugurated. Um, so well, I think it can be any of those. I'm going to need you to pick one, sir, for the million dollars. All right. For, so for a million dollars, I'm going to say that part of the spike was due to um, the uh, Vegas uh, massacre. All right. Let's see if Dale wins the one million dollars. The answer is you should have gone with your lifeline. Logic's Grammy nominated song. Very good. Yeah, you, you chose the right lifeline. You just got to trust. You just got to trust your friends more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, moving right along. Uh, we have our updates from AFSP. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I have a new setup, so it took me a second to get back on camera. Um, I wanted to make note of a couple bills that have been introduced recently. They don't directly relate to the suicide prevention lifeline and crisis services, but they're definitely adjacent. And so the first one I want to make note of, and I'll put these in the chat after I finish speaking, um, is HR 5235. That's the Student Mental Health uh, Helpline Act, and that's by Representatives Newman and Stort. And it provides grants to establish or maintain student mental health and safety lines. And so it's helping provide funding to lines like the Safe UT or the efforts that are in Colorado and Illinois. And there is some language that prioritizes um, contracting with already existing lifelines, in addition to a study um, about how the lifeline and these lines relate to each other. So I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. And the second bill I wanted to note is it's HR 5352 and S2811. And that's the Military Suicide in the 21st Century Act. This bill is reintroduced. 
Um, it's a pilot program to pre-program the Veterans Crisis Line and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline into service member smartphones. Um, so these are two bills that were recently introduced and AFSP is supporting them. Thank you so much. Any, any, there was anything else on national initiatives? I think that Sarah may have some additional things to add. Hi, I'll just uh, go very quickly. Um, the continuing resolution is keeping the government open and funded at that FY21 level through December 3rd. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm gonna drop a couple of uh, press releases into the chat box of some request for information comment opportunities uh, in the Senate, uh, both on mental health. So I will drop those in the chat. Uh, one deadline is this Friday for the Bennett Cornyn um, RFI opportunity. And then the larger Senate Finance Committee uh, RFI uh, responses are due November 1st. So I will drop those in the chat and encourage people if they've got uh, some things to comment on to, to provide some letters. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, do we have any quick updates? Angela, Laura, Paul, or Tom Bitlock. Uh, thanks, I'll just add very quickly um, that Michigan introduced late last week, two bills related to uh, the crisis continuum, uh, uh, HB 5353 and HB 5354. Um, the second bill, HB 5354, does include a 988 fee, that is set um, at the state level of 55 cents. Um, so that is the latest uh, introduction. Um, I know, um, you know, we have this updated map and so we'll, uh, you know, work with Angela and team to update. Uh, there are a couple of bills that will carry over to the 2022 session. Um, so while they didn't kind of get where we wanted them to go in 2021, they may be eligible to come back for 2022. So, um, Kind of that's my update and I'll, I'll of course defer to Angela or Paul. That was a perfect update, Laura, as always. I'll, I'll just mention that New Jersey has two 988 bills that are comprehensive um, and include a fee. They haven't moved yet, but advocates are looking to push uh, those bills during the lame duck session, which starts in November. Um, I will add that even though uh, most uh, state legislation, uh, legislative sessions are, are uh, done for the year, it doesn't mean nothing is happening. There are a lot of state agencies and legislators all across the country that are working right now and gearing up for next year's sessions. Um, however, that isn't the case in every state. So if you're in a state that isn't actively planning for legislation, uh, we'd love to have you weigh in. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, was there anything else for the quick updates? All right, we do want to remind everyone that we have our, our, our cards here on the screen. We want to remind everyone that the cards are on the Crisis Talk community uh, site. If anyone wants to download them, we have Nevada, we have Washington. I believe we have shown these before. We, we will be adding uh, new ones soon. Uh, but if you want to download, download those, you can go to the Crisis site and uh, Crisis Talk Learning Community site and you can download those. All right, uh, and so coming up, we have coming soon, we have Dr. Mark Reagans focusing on recovery on October 13th. We have Dr. Amy Watson, the work first, workforce doesn't exist, now what? On October 27th, uh, November 10th to be announced. And then um, Dr. Madeline Gould, lifeline evaluation and impact on November 10th. And uh, as we close out, I just wanna give a moment to, uh, to Tom Insel to talk about Mindsight. Oh, thank you, Victor. Uh, just real quickly, this is a, a really, I hope, I hope, important new effort uh, to create a platform. It's a digital publication that we just haven't had uh, in the mental health space. As much as I love this jam and I've been a quiet participant for the last many, many months, there are 250, sometimes 300 of us, and we want to get this message out to 250,000 people. Uh, Mindsight is launched last week. Um, I've got the a note here, I'll put it in the chat so you can see. Uh, my request is that uh, you subscribe, please uh, become a, a subscriber. We'll have uh, not only a lot of content uh, every week on a whole range of different issues. Crisis is only one of them. Um, it's what we call solution-focused journalism, so pointing out the things that are happening around the world that all of us need to know about. 
but I also am uh, here trolling for content and hoping that many of you will contribute ideas, contribute your best thoughts about things that all of us need to know, not just those who are here on the jam, but much more broadly. So Mindsight News, uh, it's live. The newsletters, which will be daily and there'll be a weekly research roundup will surface over the next couple of weeks. Um, we're hoping this will be uh, one of the things that can really spark a social movement for mental health. Uh, so I'm super excited to let you know about it. I hope you'll all participate. Back to you, Victor. All right. Thank you, Tom. And thank you all for being with us today for the Crisis Jam. It has been my pleasure to be your host. Um, and until next time, in the words of the late, great Don Cornelius, we wish you love, peace, and soul. Enjoy the rest of your day.